Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Reason, where we celebrate free minds, free markets, and in about 60 minutes' time, free booze. <laughs> uh, my name is Tom Clockerty. I'm the managing editor at Reason Foundation, uh, and I'm going to be moderating tonight's discussion. Our topic this evening, as I'm sure you're aware, is immigration. Specifically, we're asking, should America open its borders? Do we need less immigration? Do we need more immigration? Do we need a different kind of immigration? Should we let the free market decide, or should a responsible government manage the flow of labor? To answer all these questions, and hopefully more besides, we've assembled a panel of great speakers representing, I think, a range of opinion on this topic. Uh, speaking first, and immediately to my left, we have Brian Kaplan. Uh, Brian is a professor of economics at George Mason University. He's the author of two books, The Myth of the Rational Voter, and more recently, Selfish Reasons to Have More Kids. He does, in fact, have some of his kids here, uh, just as proof. Uh, Brian blogs and frequently in support of open borders at EconLog. Uh, speaking second, and sitting in the middle, we have Mark Krikorian. Mark is executive director of the Center for Immigration Studies. Uh, he's the author of The New Case Against Immigration, both legal and illegal, and how Obama is transforming America through immigration. And last, but certainly not least, we have Alex Narasta, uh, an immigration policy analyst from Cato's uh, Center for Global Liberty and Prosperity, where Alex spends his days making the case for more liberal immigration policies. Uh, everyone has a strict 10-minute time limit up here on the stage. If they reach nine minutes, I'll give them a warning. Uh, when they hit 10, the orchestra will play them off, like we're at the Oscars. Uh, so without further ado, over to Brian Kaplan. Brian. Thank you. Awesome. Under current laws, it is illegal for a foreigner to work for a, milling, for a willing American employer or rent from a willing American landlord without government permission. Uh, for most foreigners, this permission is impossible to obtain. Uh, as a result, hundreds of millions who want to move here are stuck in their birth countries. Uh, most would-be immigrants are desperately poor, uh, but could easily work their way out of poverty if they were here. I say America should open its borders to all of them. Every other country should do the same, but given America's illustrious open borders tradition, it is fitting that we lead the way. Uh, my case for open borders comes down to two arguments, uh, one moral and uh, one empirical. Uh, so the moral claim, uh, immigration restrictions are unjust. Letting people work for willing employers and rent from willing landlords is not charity. It's basic decency. And even though foreigners wickedly chose the wrong parents, they're clearly people. Uh, the empirical claim. Being just to foreigners would cost us less than nothing. When people immigrate here to work, they simultaneously enrich themselves and us. Although uh, a high-skilled worker enriches us more than a low-skilled worker, the typical low-skilled worker is far better than nothing, and there's plenty of room for everyone. Uh, let's start with the laws and justice. Uh, imagine the US made it illegal for blacks or women or Jews to take certain jobs or live in certain neighborhoods. Uh, you wouldn't just object, you would be appalled. Uh, whatever your specific moral views happen to be, uh, you know that it's wrong to prohibit a black, a woman, or a Jew from taking a job from a willing employer. Uh, my question, how is mandatory discrimination against foreigners any, le you know, any, any, any less wrong than mandatory discrimination against blacks, women, or Jews? Uh, the leading rationale is that we should take care of our own first, uh, which might be a good argument against giving foreigners welfare, but it's an Orwellian argument against letting foreigners work for a willing employer. Uh, minding your own business when two, when two strangers trade with each other is not a form of charity. Uh, now, you might think this is just a weird libertarian point, but it's actually not. Uh, I have never put crazy glue in the doors of the Center for Immigration Studies. Uh, this does not make me a donor. <laughs> I am not making a charitable donation when I refrain from keeping people out of their building. Rather, I'm doing the most basic thing I'm expected to do, which is leave them alone. Uh, now, friends of immigration restrictions often compare nations to families. I'm happy to accept the analogy. Uh, so I love my children far more than I love all the rest of you put together. That's a fact. Uh, this is a good reason to worry that if a conflict of interest ever arises, I will treat you unjustly. It's quite possible that I would. <laughs> uh, but. That is not an excuse for me to treat you unjustly. Uh, the fact that I want my beloved son to get a job uh, does not justify slashing his rival candidate's tires the morning of the final interviews. And the same goes for immigration policy. 
Uh, the, the fact that you love Americans more than foreigners may tempt you to treat foreigners unjustly, uh, but it is not an excuse for treating them unjustly. Now, we should refrain from treating other people unjustly even when it is in our interest to do so. All right, so in the zombie apocalypse, uh, you should not eat me just because you're hungry and I am wimpy. Um, yet, uh, in the, fortunately, in the real world, justice usually does pay. Uh, becoming a violent criminal is a poor path to prosperity. Uh, so were Jim Crow laws. Uh, what about immigration laws? Uh, so this brings me to my second big claim. Uh, being just to foreigners would cost us less than nothing. Uh, everyone has its problems. Uh, everyone has its problems. Uh, opponents, of uh, opponents of immigration spend a lot of their time staring at immigrants and finding fault. Uh, but if you pick a random would-be immigrant, even, if, even a random would-be illiterate peasant, um, immigrant, and calmly weigh his positives and his negatives, the sum is positive for us. Uh, to see why, you need a little, a little labor economics. So hard fact, immigration laws trap people in countries where workers produce far less than their potential. Uh, when Haitians move to the United States, uh, their wages easily increase 20-fold. So that's not plus 20%, that's plus 2,000%. Plus 2,000 percent. Now, the reason is not that American employers are much nicer than Haitian employers. The reason is that Haitians in America produce over 20 times as much as the very same Haitian would produce back home in Haiti. Right? And there's not, no big surprise. Think about how little you could actually accomplish in Haiti. What could you do there? Right? You would not be able to do very much. Uh, now, how much would total production actually rise under, uh, uh, rise under open borders? So every economist who has, an, who has asked this question has reached an astronomical answer. A uh, typical estimate is that global free migration would roughly double global output, and so increase the output of the world by a factor of two. Right, so if now if the U.S. alone opened its borders, this would have a smaller effect than the entire world opening its borders. On the other hand, the effect on U.S. output would almost certainly be to more than double because we would be getting, an, a, a, we'd be getting the immigrants who otherwise would be going to other countries. Now, how exactly is vastly higher production in your self-interest or in the self-interest self of Americans in general? Uh, the obvious reason, more stuff produced means more stuff consumed. But you can't consume stuff unless it gets produced, and if it gets produced, someone is going to end up with it. Right, so this is not just trickle-down economics. It's what I call Niagara Falls economics. Oh, yeah. hmm. Uh, you know, production, so production is what distinguishes the rich world of today from the wretched world of the pre-modern era. Right? Or just imagine what would happen to your, your standard of living if half of America suddenly retired. Production would fall, and it would be bad for you because production is good for you. Now, production always has its naysayers. Right? So when driverless cars arrive, hopefully in time so my kids don't have to learn how to drive, <laughs> uh, you can count on people to complain that they're putting truck drivers out of work. Right? Count on it. There will be complaining. Uh, but of course, by this logic, we'd be richer if lawmakers in the 19th century had banned the tractor. Uh, the fundamental truth of economic growth is this. Uh, innovation often hurts immediate competitors, but it is also the fountainhead of rising prosperity. Now, doesn't immigration hurt workers by increasing the supply of labor? Uh, well, it is actually complicated because immigration also increases the demand for labor, right? because those workers buy stuff. <laughs> also, to grasp immigration's full effect, to get everything all together, the most helpful thing to do is to keep both of your eyes focused firmly on production. Right? Trapping Mexican farm workers on primitive Mexican farms starves them and us. Right? It's far better if they move here and enrich themselves by putting better and cheaper food on our tables. Now, like driverless cars, uh, immigration can impoverish some Americans while enriching the rest. So I'm a native-born research professor, and uh, as a result of a strange immigration loophole, actually about half the people in my occupation are foreign-born. Uh, won't go into the details, but they're there. And if you've ever been to a college classroom, you know very often they're hard to understand. <laughs> All right. Uh, now, closing this loophole would give my career a very big shot in the arm. So I like to say, you know, without all these immigrants, I might have a job at Harvard. There's an immigrant right now sitting in the office in Har at Harvard that rightfully belongs to me. Uh, so um, now most, you know, so most labor economists similarly find that additional that, 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 uh, that additional immigration is bad for high school dropouts. Now, how can I can see these negative effects and still tell you that illiterate foreigners are much better than nothing? Uh, well, because unlike Mark uh, from the videos of him that I've seen. 
I don't look at a would-be immigrant and ask, is there any possible downside? Anything at all that's wrong? Any complaint at all that comes to mind? Uh, instead, I ask, is his net effect positive? Let's get all the positive, all the negative, calm down, add it up, see where it goes. And so every innovation is bad for someone, but innovation is still good. Right? Every immigrant is bad for someone, but immigration is still good. Now, why do I have to be so radical? I mean, why do I have to be so radical about this? Uh, so in part, because this is a matter of basic human rights. Uh, we don't have to give foreigners welfare or let them vote. But treating fellow human beings like criminals for working without government permission is unconscionable. Uh, now, what cements my radicalism, though, is that doing the right thing would actually cost us less than nothing. If you think the production leads to poverty, open borders should terrify you. Otherwise, the sooner America opens its borders, the better. Thank you. There are five seats still available in the room here, uh, two down at the front and three, four maybe on that side there. So if uh, you guys want to come and be seated, please go ahead now. And now, Mark Rikorian, over to you. Thank you. Um, is this on? It is. Okay, good. Um, I'm the uh, designated fall guy here. Uh, it's two against one, so I really am here for the free booze. Um, <laughs> The, uh, I'm actually delighted that Brian is as radical as he is, and in fact, I nominate him as a lobbyist for the pro-immigration side in Congress, because I can't lose at that point. Um, but we're not here to debate specifics of immigration policy. I mean, if it comes up in q and I'm happy to talk about it. But the announcement specifically said whether the U.S. should open its borders. That's what we're debating, not H-1Bs, not Chuck Schumer's bill, what have you. Now, open borders strictly mean something. I mean, if words mean anything, open borders means that the border of the United States, the national frontier of the United States, would be dealt with in the same way, people would approach it in the same way as you deal with the border between Virginia and the district, which I crossed this morning when I came to work. In other words, there'd be no officers, there'd be authorities, there'd be no customs, there'd be no checking, no nothing. That's what open borders actually means. Um, and, uh, of course, that would also mean that al-Qaeda terrorists get to move around anywhere they want, Mexican cartel assassins get to move around anywhere they want, um, and uh, uh, it would essentially represent the abolition of nationhood and uh, their subordination to uh, what Tennyson called the Parliament of Man and the Federation of the World. Now, I'm happy to concede that's not what my colleagues here are going to be arguing for. Now, having established that all three of us are actually opposed to open borders, what are we talking about? We're talking about what Brian laid out, which is essentially unlimited labor migration. Open borders light might be a way to put it. In other words, there would be no numerical limits on non-criminal, non-terrorist people moving to the United States. It's not open borders, but that's sort of, we're using it, open borders as a kind of shorthand to describe that. Um, and it wouldn't necessarily be labor migration. Uh, people would come for whatever reason they wanted. Many of them wouldn't work. But um, as long as they were not coming to kill people, um, they would be allowed to do so. Now, this isn't as radical as uh, Brian actually would suggest. I mean, George H.W. Bush laid out a case for that. In January 2004, after 9-11, the White House kind of hoped people had kind of forgotten about 9-11, and so they restarted their immigration push. And his big speech in January 2004 called for the admission of any willing worker anywhere in the world, at any number, in any industry, anywhere in the country, working for any employer that wanted to hire him. It is exactly what Brian laid out, um, unlimited labor migration. Uh, so, so it's actually not quite as radical as it seems, it's just that Brian is more honest and forthright and clear in talking about it than politicians are, which is no surprise because almost anybody would be more honest and forthright in talking about things than politicians. Let me just touch on my three objections, my three concerns with this. One is, relates to patriotic solidarity. Um, Aristotle wrote that humans gather first in the family and then in the clan or village 
and then ultimately in the state or the polis. That the polis or the state is part of human nature, that human beings have in their nature the formation of political communities. Those communities uh, have a certain claim on our loyalty. And the members of those communities, the concerns and the preferences of those members, trump the concerns and preferences of foreigners. I mean, it's sort of, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, I'm not saying anything radical, but nonetheless, this is what we're talking about. We're dealing with first, uh, first issue, first questions here. Um, now, this doesn't imply any specific immigration policy necessarily. You could be for more immigration or less immigration or what have you, but it does mean that the effects immigration may or may not have on Americans is more important than whatever benefits or harms or whatever that our immigration policy would have on foreigners. And, I mean, in a sense, selfishness is sort of the whole point of, of gathering together in social communities. Uh, to go back to Aristotle, um, in the ethics, he said that every virtue has two related vices. One is the excess of the characteristic that marks that virtue. One is the, the deficiency of it. Well, uh, fellow feeling or national or, or patriotic solidarity with your own countrymen is a virtue. And it has two related vices. One is the excess of it, which you could call xenophobia, for instance, or something of that kind. The other is the lack of it. The, um, and it was, uh, this really sort of struck home to me years ago when I did a Council on Foreign Relations event here in DC on immigration, and I kind of said my piece, and afterwards spoke to this guy who was a member of the CFR, vice president at um, Citibank, come down for this thing. And he said, yeah, you know, you're right, and all this stuff you're all talking about is, uh, you know, these are legitimate concerns, but, um, you know, what, uh, somebody from Bed-Stuy or South Central LA has no greater claim on my loyalty or concerns than somebody in Kathmandu or Montevideo. And that's a position you can take. It's just uh, one that rejects, that, that, that you know, is in this, in, in my formulation here, it's a vice. It's, a, it's the... It's the manifestation of a lack of the characteristic of patriotic solidarity. And this isn't something that's um, irrelevant or can be uh, kind of wished away easily enough. As even Brian conceded, um, less skilled, marginal workers in the United States are, in fact, harmed by immigration. Um, the rest of us most of us here in this room, um, at least to some degree benefit from, at least strictly speaking, economically, not counting social service costs. But as Americans, we have a responsibility to take into account the harm that is done, not just to people with less, with little education, people, frankly, who just aren't that bright, people who are ex-cons, people who are recovering addicts. There's a whole bunch of people who are marginal to the labor market, if you will, that employers would prefer not to have to deal with if there's somebody else to hire instead. We, now, you could argue, and uh, Alex has made something like this argument, that, well, we can fix these problems by, you know, transfer payments, welfare. Uh, to some degree, we're going to have to do that, but that's not a solution because work is a social activity, not merely a matter of dollars and cents. People are not simply... Um, economic beings. And that's my second point, my second concern with, open, with this sort of open borders light image of um, unlimited labor migration is that immigrants are people too. And uh, there's this great quote that Peter Drucker had. It was in the practice of management. It wasn't about immigration, but it's relevant here. And he was recommending to people in management, in, in dealing with what he called the human resource, consideration of the human resource as human beings having Unlike any other resource, personality, citizenship, control over whether they work, how much, and how well. In other words, immigrants, when they come to a society, to a different country, bring with them all of the virtues and the vices, all of the quirks and the idiosyncrasies that all of each of us as people has. They are not just labor inputs. 
Uh, that frustrated Henry Ford immensely when uh, he complained once, and this is a common complaint among businessmen, they don't put it this way usually, is that why is it every time I hire a pair of hands there has to be this person attached to the other end of it? And the fact is that immigration brings in not just the two hands or the arms, in Spanish the berceros, this was the term of the guest worker program from Mexico, strong arms, it actually brought people connected to those arms. And precisely because immigrants are people, I get to my third point, which is that high levels of migration, much less unlimited labor migration, guarantee the increase in the size of scope of government. There is literally no way in the actual world, as opposed to you know, the dorm at midnight in your sophomore year when you've had a couple too many beers, there is no way in the real world very high levels of immigration can do anything but dramatically increase political support for bigger government and create bigger government. Um, since this is Lenin's birthday, let me give you a quote from Lenin on immigration. There can be no doubt that dire poverty alone compels people to abandon their native land. Only reactionaries can shut their eyes to the progressive significance of this modern migration of nations. Now, it wasn't just Lenin. His modern successors make the same point. Elisio Medina, until recently, was the number two guy at the SEIU, uh, Service Employees International Union, um, which is actually allied with Alex and Brian on this immigration issue, um, if nothing else. Um, is that I'm 10 sorry, minutes? That's your, that's your warning. Just, uh, yeah. Oh, okay. I'll give you 30 seconds more yeah, to finish great. it up. Uh, Elisio Medina is also uh, a vice uh, chairman of the Democratic Socialists of America, specifically said, if we expand this electorate to win, the progressive community needs to solidify, solidly be on the side of immigrants, and that we'll expand and solidify the progressive coalition in the future. And this is not a coincidence, or it's not uh, an accident. One third of all poor children live in immigrant households. Two thirds of the growth in the uninsured is driven by immigration. The increase in poverty creates, from immigration, inevitably creates political pressure for ameliorative policies by the state. Look at New York and San Francisco. That's what I'll finish with. Two of the most immigrant heavy cities in the country which have the complete panoply of left-wing policies. And there is not only no pushback from immigrant communities, the immigrant communities and their elites and their activists and their voters are completely on board and part of the leftist coalitions in those cities. If you want to negate and eliminate the chance to push libertarian policy in libertarian direction, open immigration is the way to go. Thank you, Mark. Alex Narasta, 10 minutes. Thank you very, can you hear me? Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here today to talk about this issue. I'm going to take sort of the ethical approach and then talk about some of the facts having to do with assimilation in the United States, both historically and today, to see how it's turning out. Are foreigners going to destroy our way of life, our culture, our institutions, etc.? cetera? Uh, my first point is that our classically liberal and American notions of liberty demand a presumption in favor of individual liberty, which means in favor of the right of people to voluntarily move across borders and to deal with other people, Americans, voluntarily. The burden is upon those who oppose such a right to show why it should be restricted, just as we would demand very good reasons to support taking away somebody's life, liberty, and private property for some other reasons. Now, right now, as Brian mentioned, it's illegal for almost anybody who wants to come here to come lawfully. We have about 90% closed borders, I reckon, uh, just as a thing. So, the, so uh, when Mark talks about you know, wanting to further restrict immigration, he wants to go that extra 5% from 90% to 95%. Brian and I have the much more radical position of wanting to push it back, very much closer to zero in terms of that. Now, as the law is written right now, the burden is on the immigrant to prove that he, should be a he or she should be able to immigrate. Now, I think that's entirely backwards. The burden should be on the government to demonstrate why an individual, an individual immigrant should not be able to come, and the reasons need to be really good. And by really good, I mean not violate the life, liberty, and prior property of other people. I have a very, very high probability of doing so once they are here. Now, the current system right now is the equivalent to presuming every immigrant is guilty and forcing them to prove their innocence before being able to come here. I think a view that our ethics and traditions rightly abhor. Now, what right about some of the other ethics? The question is not 
whether we favor our own families or our own countrymen, uh, our own fellow Americans over immigrants, but exactly how we can favor them. So obligations to help my family, friends, or even other Americans do not mean that I have the right to support a government that initiates coercion against others to stop them from voluntarily coming here and working with my fellow Americans. It does not extend right there. Now I'm sure Mark, I mean even uh, Mark would agree with this statement that there are some evil actions that the government could take against foreigners that they absolutely should not take even though it would benefit some Americans. I would uh, say that preventing Americans from coming here and working voluntarily is one such action that is impermissible because the harms are so drastic and vast. Now there isn't a whole lot of competition between Americans and immigrants in the U.S. labor market, but even if there was, our English common law traditions, which are another immigrant import by the way, uh, mean that even if there are economic harms, we should not block immigrants from coming here today. It's, uh, there's this old principle called damnum absque injuria. In Latin it means da uh, damages without legal injury. Um, it means that if I, open a if I have a business on a block and you open up a business down the block and compete with me and put me out of business and I lose, too bad. I do not have legal redress against you for that harm. That extends the competition in the labor market as well. Uh, the right to engage in contracts with people freely, even if they're from other countries, is a much more important right than the idea to engage in economic protectionism and to protect certain isolated groups of people from the potential competition of other people just because they come from another country. Now what about the idea of natural, that's sort of the ethical intuitionist argument. What about the natural rights argument? Well, the natural rights argument, the foundation of our country, the Declaration of Independence, is that people are equal moral worth and the rights to life, liberty, and private property precede the creation of the state. That is what the Declaration of Independence and all the Enlightenment thinkers that supported our government recognized. Um, the Declaration of Independence also, by the way, just to sum this up, listed restrictions on immigration and naturalization imposed by the British Crown as one of the reasons why the Americans fought the revolution. It's no mistake that when the phrase laissez-faire which everybody in this room knows is a moniker for laissez-faire capitalism, was also combined with laissez-passer, laissez another phrase which means let them pass, which is a nod to free immigration. And the reason why that is is because the freedom to move is a prerequisite to almost all the other freedoms as well as being a freedom in and of itself. William F. Buckley Jr., a conservative that I greatly admire, said that laws attempting to stop the flow of unauthorized immigrants were in the same category as King Canute standing on the beach and ordering the tide to not come in. On the point about sovereignty, the United States had open borders from 1790 to about 1875 and was definitely a sovereign nation during that period of time. So the notion that somehow opening borders would destroy sovereignty is just nonsense. The right of sovereignty means keeping out, the power of sovereignty means keeping out other sovereigns. Not controlling the minute labor market details or patrolling certain contracts intimately just because people are from other places. Brian laid out the utilitarian case very well, so I won't go into that. Now, under each of these ethical systems, borders are ethically irrelevant in determining somebody's worth or determining whether the government should be able to exclude people. Now, what about the rule of law? We get told numerous times that if we change our immigration law or legalize the people who are here illegally, then it will violate the rule of law. Laws have to be based on an accurate understanding and accounting of human nature and respect for liberty, not based on the whims of legislators who want to engage in tinkering with America's social fabric. The, uh, the rule of law also means that they, the laws have to be predictable, they have to be applied equally, and they have to be consistent with our traditions of individual liberty. The immigration laws fail on every single one of those points. They are not predictable, just talk to a lawyer. They are certainly not equally applied, just take a look at the per country quotas and certain visas, and they definitely are not consistent with our traditions in favor of more open immigration that existed when this country was founded and existed certainly after that and go back much further. You can find them in Blackstone and Cook and even in the Magna Carta uh, talking about the rights of migration. Now talking about welfare, I don't like transfer payments. I think there's probably a role for charity, but the notion that immigrants will use welfare is not really an argument against immigration, it's an argument against welfare. It's basically akin to making the same argument that because we have some socialized medicine in the United States, we should have mandatory dietary restrictions on everybody in the country. Now I'm sure everybody up here would agree, and everybody in the audience would agree hopefully that, that is a, a bad point against liberty, and certainly some socialized medicine doesn't 
justify even further restrictions on immigration. The idea is that socialized medicine should get rid of regardless. Now about the issue of uh, patriotic assimilation, now I do consider myself an American patriot, uh, maybe not a nationalist, but certainly an American patriot, and this is something that I do spend a lot of time uh, thinking about. Uh, Samuel Huntington wrote a book in the mid-90s, he's a Harvard professor, uh, wrote a book in the mid-90s called Who Are We? And he basically lays out a lot of uh, testable hypotheses in this book, one of which is that Hispanic immigrants and their descendants will not be as patriotic as other Americans. While there have been numerous studies since then by Citrin and Al, published in 2007 in the Journal of Political Perspectives, that shows that correcting for age and education, Hispanic Americans born here are more patriotic than other native-born Americans. They are more likely to say America is the best country in the world by that measurement. Now, all of the other arguments you've heard about assimilation or you're going to hear about patriotic assimilation are the same arguments that have been said about every single ethnic group or immigrant group, sorry, immigrant group throughout American history. It was said about Huguenots, Jews, Irish, Italians, Russians, Poles, etc. There was a book written in 1927, kind of a funny book, called uh, The Melting Pot Mistake. You will not find a different argument in there that is not wielded today against immigration, and they are wrong in every single sense of the word. They weren't wrong because there was some Americanization movement that pushed people to become Americanized. If you look back at the history of that movement, it was kind of a joke, it was kind of silly, and likely it pushed people to not assimilate as much as it was uh, as they are today. Now, in terms of political solidarity, this is good as a point that I was actually uh, willing to try to make. Oh, uh, sorry, about assimilation. Arguably, internal American migration has had much vaster impact on American political institutions and on culture than any foreign-born population has ever had on America and the United States. The 8 million black Americans and 20 million white Americans from the American South who immigrated to other parts of the country in the 20th century, I will argue, had a vastly greater impact on the culture and on the politics of this country than any immigrant wave throughout American history likely will in terms of that. Um, all of the arguments that you hear against immigration could equally apply to movements between states, to movements of people between states. I grew up in crazy California, in the LA area, and it was kind of a culture shock coming to Virginia to uh, study under Brian and other professors at GMU. Um, so the notion, that, so that has definitely impacted the culture of Virginia and the millions of other people who do too, but that is not a sufficiently great reason to stop the movement of people across borders internally, and I recommend it does not sufficiently great reason to do so internationally. Now, open borders, opening up the border. Oh, and I want to also say that it's not a coincidence that the two biggest increases in government in the, in the 20th century happened after the borders were closed. The New Deal happened during the 1930s when legal immigration to the United States was far more difficult than it is today after the country ended uh, open borders with Europe during the 1920s. I don't think that's a mistake. I also don't think it's a mistake that the Great Society programs, the creation of Medicare and Medicaid happened during the 1960s when the foreign-born population of the United States was at its lowest point in the entire history of this country even going back to colonial times. I don't think that's a mistake. In terms of the impact of immigrants on political uh, institutions in the United States, uh, there, doesn't, there doesn't seem to be an impact toward uh, bigger government. Open borders is the opposite of big government because it would, rem uh, it would mean removing some of the most economically destructive laws in the books. There is no legitimate ethical reason to stop the movement of peaceful and healthy people, healthy people across board, borders. There are vastly different and uh, huge economic gains from doing so. Furthermore, it's consistent with our traditions of liberty in this country, enlightenment traditions, and every other single ethical system that we hold dear as Westerners. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the one point I want to I'd want to make, and this may come up in Q and A too. Um, uh, Alex specifically made a couple of references to the past. And um, the, not to flack my book, which is on Amazon, if you'd like, and the digital remainder bin, I'm afraid, but um, uh, the, point, the point is the past is a different country. Uh, and in our, our, in our example in particular, um, things have changed that relate to immigration so profoundly that the experience of the past is simply no longer relevant. Um, let me give you a couple of examples. We did not, in fact, have numerical limits on immigration until 1921. And before that, there were some, there were some limits that had 
begun to develop in the late 19th century to keep out prostitutes and pimps and anarchists and terrorists and what have you. Chinese. Um, Chinese as well, it's true. Um, uh, and the Japanese uh, gentlemen's agreement limit the number of uh, Japanese. Um, but the fact is that the reason there were no numerical limits for so long is twofold. The first is simply that the country was pretty empty and um, you know we needed people to settle the land and to be blunt about it to you know push the Indians out of the way. Um, that was the point really of immigration. But also the oceans limited the numbers. It was very difficult to get here. A hundred years ago you didn't hop on a plane and go to your uh, aunt's wedding in Palermo and then come back for work after a three-day weekend. Um, the, the, the fact is technology has fundamentally changed the um, uh, calculus with regard to assimilation and other aspects of immigration. And the other thing that's changed, and this relates to the Americanization that Alex referred to, is that our elite culture has completely rejected the idea of patriotic assimilation. And this isn't Mark, just uh, can we what? wrap that point up yeah, okay. and then let's move to the questions. And, and this is this is what's fundamentally different. The Americanization movement in the past was a manifestation of a broader social demand for um, assimilation to American norms. It wasn't a thing on its own, and that demand is actually completely inverted and reversed. That and it's not just a government issue; it exists in corporations and schools and every church and every daycare center everywhere that our elite culture um, sets the tone and the, uh, the terms of discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our panel.